Hi, I'm Scott Houston, your host of the Local Officials Stronger Together podcast series. We're about to embark on a new adventure. We're going to be doing short videos explaining different facets of how the pool operates. The first one we'll do will be a series called the STP Special Report on Re-Rates. And we'll be talking about the drivers of rates for the upcoming season. Please join us as we learn about this important topic. This episode is part of the pool's Local Officials Stronger Together podcast series. It's one way we serve local officials through integrity, public service, fiscal responsibility, and operational excellence. As always, please direct specific questions about coverage to your member services manager. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you do at the pool, how long you've been at the pool, and what your title is, Phil. Okay. My name is Phil English. I've worked for the risk pool for 27 years. I'm currently a workers' compensation claims manager. Pretty impressive, 27 years, right? Yes. That's, that's amazing. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about, obviously, workers' compensation. And one of the things we're going to focus on as a rate driver is going to be the first responder's disease presumption. And this can be somewhat of a complicated law, but the bottom line is the law provides that for first responders, which would generally be fire, police, and EMTs, that if they contract certain diseases, it's presumed for workers' comp purposes that they got those diseases while at work. And that's an important benefit, right, because all of their medical is covered, some pay may be covered. If uh, it's an unfortunate fatality claim, then the surviving spouse may be entitled to benefits for the remainder of that spouse's life. So it's an important law, and it's been a cost driver for the pool for several years since it passed. But I'd like to talk today about how the law comes into play with regard to COVID. Because as COVID came into play originally, we treated it as a presumption. Why did we do that? That, that is a great question. Presumption has been in the law for several years for mostly cancer and heart attacks. Um, when COVID came around, you know, knowing that uh, it was impacting the first responders, you know, probably more than others, uh, the pool took a, a real hard look at that. This is, you know, right at the beginning of March 2020, as the pandemic is, is coming on, uh, really didn't know the best way to approach COVID to start. But with the support of the others in the workers' compensation department, as well as the pool's executive team, we decided to handle COVID-19 for first responders under the presumption. Within the presumption statute, it uh, talks about other respiratory illnesses. And at the time, it certainly appeared that COVID-19 was affecting people in the respiratory system. So uh, it, it thought, we thought that it would be a good idea to, to just go ahead and manage claims under the presumption statute as it was. And so that's how we really got our start in, in handling and managing the, the COVID-19 claims. At that time, uh, you know, there was only a handful of claims and, and it really picked up, you know, through 2020 and there were several different surges of, of claims and we were very fortunate that we were able to uh, have enough staff in place to, to manage those surges. So that's one of the benefits of the pool, right? We try to get to a place where we can provide coverage for our members, unlike in some cases an insurance company where they may be trying to figure out ways to deny a claim. We're there to help. And so we treated... Uh, COVID as a presumption under an existing provision of law that you mentioned related to respiratory illnesses. Well, later, come 2021, when the Texas legislature met, they actually passed a law that was retroactive that said everybody should have been treating COVID as a presumption claim, right? Tell us right, about that. Right. That, uh, that particular law was Senate Bill 22, and it was an added uh, section under the current presumption law, and that went into effect on June 14th of 2021. And it also had provisions within it that would require uh, any first responder claims that had been previously denied to be reprocessed. Uh, you know, that would be a, a big task on the organizations that didn't include COVID-19 as presumption as those claims were, were taking place. For the pool, uh, we didn't have any claims to reprocess. You know, we had already handled the claims in, in accordance with what ultimately was the statute through Senate Bill 22. Uh, with Senate Bill 22, there were additional guidelines that were put into the statute. Gave a little bit of a better uh, way to handle claims. 
it specifically stated that there must be a positive test and that the employee would have at least had to have worked within 15 days of that test. Right. So we were in compliance with that way before the legislature had to mandate it. Right, and so for the last uh, fun year, the board of directors decided to not uh, try to recoup any money for the COVID presumption. It took sort of a wait and see approach. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting because those numbers really skyrocketed, I think beyond what most would have expected, right? So tell us a little about the actual numbers, where we're at now as, as in terms of uh, COVID numbers and dollar mm -hmm. amounts. Mm -hmm. We, um, through the pandemic, like I had mentioned, started you know in March of 2020, through current, we've handled you know 7,700 COVID claims. Uh, mostly first responder, but of course we had plenty of claims of non-first responders that we, that we worked through. There have been 46 first responder fatalities. Uh, in looking at the numbers, uh, the impact of the pool is just over 90 million incurred loss, and we've paid about 23 million to date in, in paid losses. The, the, uh, the paids would be for indemnity benefits that the workers would receive, death benefits for, for the uh, surviving spouses, as well as the medical uh, that goes along with that. Right, and so thus far, that, those claims, uh, whether paid or incurred, have been coming out of existing reserves, uh, the members' equity that we have. That's awesome. Thanks, Phil, for being here, and thanks for sharing how y'all dealt with the COVID uh, disease presumption and look forward to seeing you soon. Very Appreciate good. it. Thank you for your time. All right. So Claudia, tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to the pool and what you do as a member services manager. Yeah, sure. So prior to joining the risk pool, I was the risk manager for one of our member cities. And about a year and a half ago, I joined the member services team here at the risk pool. Awesome. And are you enjoying your time here so far? I am. I am. So, you know, ha having that experience with local government and, and, the, and my, my background in human resources and risk management, I now have the opportunity to work with our South Texas members in this capacity. That's awesome. Yeah. Tell me what you do as a member services manager. I know that the member services manager is the primary point of contact for most members, but... There's so much more that you do. Tell us a little bit about what you would do for me if I were the fund contact and you were just coming to visit me for the first time as a member uh, representative. Yeah, of course. So uh, every year, we'll, we as member services uh, managers, we meet with our fund contact, you know, a representative from, from uh, a member organization. And uh, as part of our role, we, we partner with you, we sit with you to evaluate your exposures you know, and, and help you identify what coverages will best fit the needs of your organization, you know, whether you choose to you know, retain those exposures or what coverages will best suit your needs. And um, you know, as part of that, we can also help you look at a deductible analysis, so a, a cost-benefit analysis to review if your deductibles, your limits, are where they should be to meet your needs, of course. Right. So you could help them figure out how much they want to spend versus how much risk they want to retain is really yeah. what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, and, and looking at their uh, unique loss history. And, and of course, you know, as our member cities, organizations grow and expand, you know, needs do, do change year after year. Right. So our member services managers are really our key point of contact with the members, right? Y'all are the ones that are the boots on the ground out there helping them figure out what kind of coverages they need. Mm -hmm. But I think part and parcel with that, you've also got to take their rates to them every fund year and explain to them what's going on with those rates. Yeah, yeah, so, so that, that's probably our, our busiest time of year, which starts about, about now. Right. So at, at this time, you know, we, we start requesting information, you know, whether it's their budgets, uh, we may need, uh, other exposure information. You know, we this is also a great time for our members to look at their schedules. So our members do have, you know, schedules of, of covered items such as their, their real and personal property, right. their vehicles or mobile equipment. And by reviewing that and ensuring accuracy, you know, as, as we continue through the uh, rebate process, 
you know, we're, we're working with uh, an accurate schedule. So ensuring that we're covering what they want, what, what should be covered. Right. And I think that's really important, right? We hear a lot about schedules and encouraging members to ensure that their schedules are up to date mm -hmm. because if their schedules aren't up to date and they have some type of a problem, it's possible that that might not be covered to the full amount. Is that possible? Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. And, you know, and unlike typical insurance, you know, be, being part of the risk pool, you know, is, you know we, we are a partnership and we pride ourselves in, in that. And, you know, we work with our members and, and this is, you know, the time of year where, you know, we do encourage them as a best practice to review these schedules and, you know, and with tools available uh, to our members, such as the member portal, you know, they're able to work on these live schedules at any given time, you know, make, make sure that, you know, they're, they're updated as the year goes by. So it doesn't have to be all done at once, right. you know, so it's not a, uh, you know, it doesn't feel like a daunting process to go through, but, you know, just maintaining really their schedules. So that's, that's a great point to get across in this interview mm -hmm. is the updating of the property schedules. It's such an important component of a member's coverage mm -hmm. that I'm glad we got a chance to talk about that. Let's kind of circle back a little bit and talk about the liability coverage that the pool provides. So if a member has, quote, liability coverage, tell us a little bit about what that means, uh, the different components of that. Yes, yeah, so, so electing liability coverage, you know, uh, there are different types of coverage that fall under liability. And depending on the unique needs or the operations of a member, it, the, the lines of coverage may, may or may not apply. So. Uh, we have general liability, we have errors and omission, we have auto liability, and law enforcement liability. Right. And so that comes with auto liability, that comes back around to the schedules, right? It's important to keep those updated. Tell us a little bit about law enforcement liability. I think that's one of the things that's been at the forefront over the last few years mm -hmm. with regard to police reform and, and various aspects of law enforcement. Tell me a little bit about the coverage that the pool provides, and maybe could you give me an example of what a law enforcement claim might be? Yeah, of course. So, um, with law enforcement liability, like you mentioned, there there's been an increase. You know, not just in Texas, but really everywhere. With, and we refer to it as social inflation. Mm -hmm. There's been an increase in in claims made against cities, and you know, a, a claim may have to do with the use of uh, or alleged excessive force. It can be a wrongful arrest, and so uh, as these claims are made against our member cities, you know the, the risk pool will defend the member. Tell me a little bit about uh, other components of that coverage, like uh, what if somebody slips and falls on a member's property? Yeah, yeah, and w which is probably one of the most common scenarios we see. Right. You know, even though it, it may not result in a in a large claim, but yes, as part of general liability, or you know, we have premises liability where, you know, if there's a slip, trip, and fall, you know, that uh, a citizen, you, you know, um, experiences, that this is where the general liability uh, coverage would would come in. Right. Right. Awesome. Um, the the I think probably the best part of your interview uh, is that. You'll be talking a little bit, I'm going to ask you now a little bit about rates. And since we're talking specifically about liability rates, mm -hmm. you've got one of the best uh, interviews of all because the liability rate itself is not increasing for this upcoming fund year. Right, right. right. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, that's, that, that's great news. And, and um, yeah, that, so that there, would, there isn't going to be a rate change when it comes to the lines of coverage that fall under liability. And when we look at what how contribution is calculated, we do uh, look at three different components. So we consider the experience, which is the loss history of, of a particular member. We look at the rates, which is where we're, we're not seeing an, uh, a change this year. And then finally, we look at the exposure. Now, while we're not seeing a change in the rates for this upcoming fund year, our members who have had a loss history, you know, where the severity of their claims is higher, you know, particularly in the last three or four years, those members uh, can anticipate seeing an increase in their contribution, mm -hmm. and and that's and that's primarily because as loss history, you know, their loss experience increases. 
their experience modifier will deteriorate. And so sometimes the you know, members might hear us refer to the experience modifier as an X mod or an E mod, and, and really all that means is you know, the last couple of years of uh, losses. Right. And that's a real key with regard to this, right? Because mm -hmm. while the rates aren't increasing, if a member has a number of accidents or, or costly claims against them, their rate may go up. But that's why our loss prevention folks are here is to help Absolutely. them prevent those uh, accidents or injuries or problems before they even become a claim. Well, the risk pool is really lucky to have you. I'm glad you yeah, jumped you, ship and join us. Thank you. And uh, thanks for talking about liability. And we'll see you soon. To review written materials associated with this episode or to ask Scott a question, please visit www.tml irp.org and click on the STP podcast button. For specifics about your entity's coverages or rates, please contact your member services manager.